Greetings all. Welcome to multivariable calculus. Let's begin in the system that we're going to spend a lot of time in all semester, all this series of lectures. The 3D rectangular coordinate system is the system that's an extension of the XY two-dimensional rectangular coordinate system. It's an extension in the means that I have now added a z-axis, okay? Now, of course, you're used to your normal x-axis being horizontal, y-axis being vertical, and I don't know if anyone ever told you that, but that's a right-handed system, and the reason we call it that is because of the way we orient rotation. If this is x and this is y in our 2D rectangular system, Remember, angles rotate from the positive x-axis towards the y-axis, like this, right? So if you take your right hand, you'll notice your thumb comes out of the board, and that's what we call a right-handed system if the third dimension is coming out at you, okay? This system, the 3D rectangular coordinate system, is supposed to be that same system. So if my x-axis is here and my y-axis is here, Notice the rotation of an angle from x into y, from the positive x-axis towards the positive y-axis, is a right-handed system because there's z, right? z is the, the third axis right there, okay? So it's a right-handed system. Normally in the xy plane, right, just use your imaginations, I can only draw in two-dimensional here. Um, in a minute, you know, we can take a look at the, at the GeoGebra version and that'll look much better than what I could draw. But for now, look, in the XY plane, you're used to using X numbers and Y numbers in that order to locate a point. Now we're gonna be locating points in three dimensions. So it'll be X, Y, and then Z. So you'll have a certain amount of X, a certain amount of Y, and then you'll come out of the plane in the Z direction. And Z can go positive up or negative down, either way, okay? The key to, to drawing in this system is making sure that whatever way you draw your X and Y, the movements in that dimension are parallel to those axes. So you'll notice while I'm moving along the, the Y direction here, this line is parallel to my Y axis. And this line right here is parallel to my x-axis. And this right here is parallel to my z-axis. And that sort of just will keep you on track for making sure that your, uh, your depth is preserved and everything, okay? Now, the, uh, another major object besides points that we're gonna be spending a lot of time with are vectors. A 3D vector is just like a 2D vector. It has components when written in the pointy bracket form, right? I'll have an X, a Y, and a Z component of V. And remember, a vector is kind of like a slope with a rise and a run. Now we'll have a rise, a run, and a depth, if you will. Whatever, whatever word uh, suits your situation the best. Um, but we basically got three components to our vectors now, okay? And sometimes vectors can be considered between two points. And again, that definition hasn't changed for vectors either. You'll still do ending point minus beginning point for the X component, for the Y component, for the Z component from point to point. And that will create a vector. So here's an example. If I have the point three, one, two, okay? So you'll notice in the X, I came out three. In the Y, I went over one. And that's how I get to this location in the plane. And then I go up two in the Z to end up right there. And then uh, negative 2, 5, 4 is this point over here. So negative 2 in the X brought me back. Then 5 over in the Y gets me to the X. Then 4 up in the Z. And then I'm going from A to B with a vector. So I'll be doing negative 2 minus 3, negative 5. 5 minus 1 is 4. And 4 minus 2 is 2 for the vector AB. I'm doing all the B components minus all of the A components to create this vector, okay? So this vector 
is the vector negative 5, 4, 2, and it basically just describes some sort of change from this point to that point in each component direction, right? Now a vector is really intended to, in, in a lot of the things we use, it's intended to give us a direction that we want to face. But don't forget, vectors also come with a size, a magnitude, and we'll be using that uh, a lot as well, okay? So we've got a direction, but we've also got a size behind our vectors, which, which will become important in certain circumstances. Okay, so an actual object that we use a lot. Vectors are sort of pseudo. Lines are actual collections of points, right? So lines is the first thing that we're gonna talk about. But you have to realize that a line is still a type of curve. It is not curved, I know, but a line is something that is just a connected string of points, just like any other curve. And now we're dealing with three-dimensional objects. So you can't just give me a y equals mx plus b anymore for a line, unless you want to, you know, not have it moving through the z dimension, okay? But even then, since we're dealing in the, the 3D rectangular system, giving me a y equals mx plus b is not going to be enough because that's gonna actually represent something else in three dimensions, okay? We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Since a line is only a curve, and technically a curve is a one-dimensional object, okay? Think about this for a second. A single point is a zero-dimensional object because it has no length, width, or breadth, right? Has no length, width, or depth, if that's the word you wanna use. A point is basically a, an unmeasurably small location on a grid or in a, in a space, okay? A line or a curve would be the next level up. They, those would be one dimensional, okay? So anytime you're in a system and you want to graph something that is more than one dimension different, okay? Like for example, lines are one dimensional and the space we're in is gonna be three dimensional. Okay, that's more than one dimension different. Then you have to use what we call parametric equations. Okay, to describe these objects, I'm gonna have to use parametric equations because that allows me to describe the components, the coordinates, X, Y, and Z of each, of indi each individual point independently. I can describe the X component, I can describe the Y component, I can describe the Z component of these objects. They must be in parametric form if they're off more than one dimension. Okay, Professor Simon, let's think about this for a second. You're telling me that I always have to do lines in parametric, but we didn't used to have to do that. No, we didn't. Because when you're in the two-dimensional uh, coordinate system, that's two dimensions, and lines are one dimension, that's only one dimension different. You can just use normal equations then. Just like now that we're in 3D, anything that's a two-dimensional surface, we will still be able to use single equations for, okay? However, since we want the line to be that much different, it's two dimensions different than our system, than our space that we're moving in, I'm going to have to describe it parametrically, okay? So just remember this for the rest of this series, okay? Anytime we want to do a curve, since we're gonna be doing 3D, curves are gonna to have to be described parametrically. Later on, we'll, we'll talk about surfaces. We can use equations or parametric equations for those. We'll, we'll have a choice. Mostly, we'll just use singular equations, okay? So, anytime I want a curve, it's gotta be parametric. Therefore, a line must be described with parametric equations, okay? Just like before with lines though, all you need is something that's a slope and a point to locate the line. In this case though, in the more generic version of a line, what we're gonna use instead of a slope measurement is a vector. A vector has all of those same measurements. If you put a vector in a 2D system, it still uses a type of rise and run to designate uh, a vector and, and which way it points, okay? We're generalizing here. 
this vector contains all of the information of the direction that the line should be heading because it talks about how it can change in the X, how it can change in the Y, and how it can change in the Z simultaneously. That's what the vector contains, the change information, how to get from one point to another point while staying in the same direction. So I'm using my vector like I would a slope. Notice my line can be set equal to the vector that you're using times some variable t plus some point that you want to be located on the, the line p. Okay, so as long as I have a point and then a vector to lead me away from the point, then I can represent the line. This is a way to, to write it, but it's a vector equation. Okay, so this isn't actually like one of the other uh, equations that you're used to writing. It has a vector component to it. And then of course this P right here is not a vector, but it is a point. It also has components to it. So this isn't exactly the same type of equation, which is why it's easier just to take this format and write it in parametric form. So notice all I'm doing is I'm doing the vector component times T plus the point component. And I just do that for each variable, okay? T is to the one power in each situation. It's gonna be a line. Those are each linear relationships, X, Y, and Z. So you're gonna get a linear relationship overall, okay? Another format that some people will use every once in a while is called symmetric equations. And basically what this is, is you, you solve for T in each of these equations. So I would subtract px here and then divide by vx here, and then I would solve for t. And you do that for each equation. And then since they're all equal to t, that means they're equal to each other, right? So x minus px over vx is the same calculation as y minus py over vy, so on and so on. We don't use these a whole lot, um, but the idea is I can eliminate the parameter t. t is not actually part of the system that we're graphing. It is the controller though. Um, parametric form is a very versatile form and, and T is your controlling variable. The values that I plug in for T will dictate the direction that the line traverses, right? The, the vector can point in a certain way, but if you say, you know, put negatives in your T's and things like that, you can actually have it walk the other direction. So T is gonna control, right, where each point is on your line. <clears throat> okay, so that's, that's how we're going to be dealing with lines. Let's go look at some examples. Here are some examples of using lines in our 3D system. Okay, so let's start with this one. They want us to graph a particular line, and then they also want to know does this line intersect either of these other two lines? Now real quick, notice the other two lines are written in vector form. That doesn't matter as far as the work we have to do. I was just trying to throw a little variety in there. You can write a line as a parametric equation, or you can also write it in the vector parametric form as well. Notice I didn't actually put a vector over M because I'm not actually treating the line as a vector. I'm just putting the components in that form to make it more concise, more efficiently uh, using the space, right? Okay, so let's start with the graphing. With the graphing, really, remember, it's a line. I just need a couple of points, and then I can connect them. Of course, I'm trying to put a 3D graph on a 2D system, so I will have to, you know, make do with what I've got here, but... But uh, after we're done here, I'll throw it up on GeoGebra and you can see uh, uh, this a lot better uh, along with the other two lines that we're not going to be graphing uh, by hand anyway. So, okay, so if you want to graph this thing, let's start with a couple of points. Let's get some easy ones going on, right? Like, for example, what happens when T is zero, right? When T is zero... I've got an x value 
of 0 plus 1 is 1, 0 plus 5, and 0 minus 1. So when t is 0, I have the point 1, 5, negative 1. Okay? And something else easy to plug in would probably be t equals 1, right? t equals 1. So when t equals 1, I'm going to get 2 plus 1, which is 3. I'm going to get negative 4 plus 5, which is 1. And I'm going to get 3 minus 1, which is 2. So I'm getting those two points. 1, 5, negative 1 and 3, 1, 2, okay? So let's graph those. If you want to get particular with these, uh, then we'll have to start doing uh, the dots. To do the dots, you really need something that can draw these things parallel, right? So for example, if I wanna label along this axis some marks to put the, uh, the coordinates on here, like that, draw it parallel, like that, and, but I've got some negatives thrown in there too, right? Here the Z needs to go to negative 1, so I'll need to go a little bit negative here for that one. Let's go ahead and draw these other ones uh, outward as well. Get a little orientation there. Okay, so again, if you want to do the dots, you're going to have to stay parallel like this. And then what you can do is you can start putting the dots like this. Kind of like how on a, a rectangular coordinate system in 2D you put the grid lines. Or you could just put dots at each mark. Like that. If this helps. You know, so on and so on like this. This could really take some time. You just got to make sure you stay parallel. Um, one of these days what I need to get is a rubber stamp. Right? For one of these things. I'm not going to sit here and draw all of these for you, but um, you get the idea. If you need the dots in order to help you make your system. Okay, now also notice if I put my ruler this way, right? They're all lined up there too, right? See, they're lined up this way too. And then of course you'll want to have the, the dots above and below and things like that. But let's see what we can do with what we have here. Uh, 1, 5, negative 1 is the first point, and I'll do that one in blue, okay? So 1 on the x-axis is here. Then I need to go 5 this way, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 this way. So it's here, but then I need to go down, like into the page basically, right? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 right here, but then I've got to go down some to the negative one here till it's parallel there. Okay? So it's actually into the sheet a little bit. Next, when t is one, I have three, one, and two. So that's gonna be one, two, three, one, and then I have to go up two from there, right? So parallel here, one, two, three, one and then up two is going to be like here like this and then of course the the line that i would need to draw from there oh let's go ahead and just do it in red here you can just connect it whatever which way so of course trying to draw 3D shapes on a 2D, you know, plane like I'm doing here is not necessarily the best. But as long as your stuff is labeled and you, you try to keep your depth pretty much with your X and Y axis especially. Okay, 
Also, real quick, this is a parametric equation. Don't forget, it's actually oriented in a certain direction. When t equals zero, I started here. And when t equals one, I made it all the way up to this point. So my line is actually oriented in this direction, here like this. That's the flow of this particular t variable, right? Uh, we could graph this same set of points, this same line, with completely different equations if we wanted to and have the t going in the other direction, okay? But the way it's written up here, this is the, the flow of that line. Now, the other questions. Does it intersect either one of these? Well, one thing I wanted to point out on this one real quick was first thing you want to notice in these lines that will you know could save you some time is are they parallel? Well, how can you tell if two lines are parallel? In the 2D system, we always said if their slopes were equal, right? So generalize that same idea. These two lines can be parallel if their vectors are pointing in the same direction, right? In other words, if their vectors are parallel. Vectors are parallel as long as they're only a scalar multiplication away from each other. So let's look at the vectors of each of these, right? Here, my, my L vector, is what I'll call it, is going to be 2, negative 4, 3. That's the vector pointing in the direction of the line labeled L. Okay, what's the M vector here? My M vector is 4, negative 8. Be careful here, look, it's reversed. The negative 8 is multiplied by the T. So it's 4, negative 8, 6, which I can rewrite this vector as 2 times 2, negative 4, 3, which is 2 times the L vector. All that means is both of these lines, both of these vectors are pointing in the same direction. Okay, So they're not going to intersect uh, unless they intersect everywhere. And, and you can check that really quick uh, if, you, if you want to plug in 1, 5 and negative 1 on the other side here you'll notice right away uh, to get 1, 5, and negative 1 would require different values of t for each coordinate. So there's no way that this point would actually exist on that line. These two lines are parallel, okay? Now, how do I determine if it intersects this next one? You can tell right away that it's not going to be parallel. Look, the vector here is 1, negative 1, 5, right? That's nowhere near a multiplication uh, for that one, right? One negative one five is not anything that I could multiply by this one. Um, also, don't forget, if things are parallel, you could also use the, the, the dot product um, uh, and the, I'm sorry, the cross product to determine these things, right? If you cross something with something that it's parallel with, you'll get zero, right? Uh, it, here, you'll see that if I cross product this uh, with this, I would get something uh, non-zero. Okay, let's not go that far though. Let's just see if these two intersect directly the right way. I'm going to start like this. I'm going to take the x component of that one and set it equal to the x component of this one. Okay, so 2t plus 1 is equal to t plus 2. But wait a second. These two t's came from different lines, right? And even if they're parallel, like in this last one, the t actually means something different for each line, okay? So I actually can't use the t here because I don't want to get it confused with the t over here, all right? So instead, what I'm going to use is a lowercase n, okay? And if you want you could go back into your original equation here and just put n's in each of these if you just want to change it all together. The thing you need to realize is, since these are completely different uh, functions, they're different graphs, they're different objects, even though the t is the same, it's not the same t between the same, uh, between the two different ones, okay? So if it helps you, go ahead and you know change this before you even do this, that's fine, okay? But I'm gonna use little n to represent 
the variable that comes from the in line. If I solve this as much as I can, what I'm going to get is 2t minus 1 is equal to n. Okay, So keep that in mind. If these two lines are going to intersect, then this relationship has to remain true for all of the coordinates. Okay, and we're gonna we're gonna exhaust that particular uh, option to see if they uh, equal each other. So next, I'm gonna set the y variables equal to each other. That will give me the equation negative four t plus five is equal to two minus t, uh, but not t. Remember, n. Okay. In this case, I'll solve as much as I can. I'll get that n is equal to 4t minus 3. And I know what you're thinking. Wait, those are different, so we automatically know they don't intersect. Be careful. That's not necessarily true, right? Because these are both linear equations, and sometimes linear equations do intersect. Here's what you do. Take this one and plug it in, right? That's going to give me 2t minus 1 equals 4t minus 3. And those are actually the same t. They are coming both from that equation after I've simplified these. Okay? So now solve this. I'm going to have 2t equals 2, which gives me t equals 1. All right? If t equals 1, plug it in. Notice that what I'm getting is 2 minus 1, which is 1. Right here, I'm getting 4 minus 3, which is 1. So I'm getting that 1 is equal to n. Okay? So at that moment, when t is 1 and n is 1, the x and y coordinates are the same. Okay? At that moment, that's, that's the, the, the closest that we can get so far. Now do the z component. 5n minus 7 is equal to... 3t minus 1. Okay? Right here, I don't even really need to do any solving. Look, I already have the possible place where they can intersect. This is just going to tell me if it's fully correct or not. So I'm going to take the, the t equals 1 and the n equals 1, and I'm going to plug them in. So 5 times 1 minus 7 should equal 3 times 1 minus 1. Right? So right here, I'm getting negative 2. And right here, I'm getting positive 2, which is false. So what this means is, even though these two lines are not parallel, they don't intersect. They come close. I got a couple of the coordinates to equal out, and most of the time, you will get that. And negative 2 is not actually far off from positive 2. But these two lines do not intersect. From the orientation that I've drawn here, okay, it might actually even look like they do intersect because this line right here would go through the point 2 to uh, negative 7, right? 2, 2 is like way down here on the z-axis. And then when t is 1, it would go through 3, 1, negative 2. So 3, 1, negative 2 would be here. I would draw these like this and make it go this way for say, oh, you know, for S and G there. It looks like they intersect, right? There's actually going to be a small gap here because it's all in the way you're viewing it. Okay, and, I, and I'll show you in a second when, when we pull this up on GeoGebra. You'll see that these two lines are actually what we call skew. One of the lines is going this way, and one of the other lines is going this way. Now, the way you're looking at my two pens right now, it looks like they intersect. But if you rotate it, right, you can see that what I'm actually doing is not intersecting them. They're not actually touching, okay? They're not parallel either. These lines are what we call skew, okay? So these are parallel. M and L are parallel, but N and L are skew, okay? They do not intersect at any point.
<clears throat> okay, the other example here, create the equation of a line that goes through these two points and then tell me, does this line actually contain this other point? Okay, so remember, to make the equation of one of these lines, I simply need a vector and a point. Well, I've already got some points, right? I just need to make a vector. So then let's label these guys, right? If I call this A and I call this B, point A and point B, right? I can make a vector AB by subtracting. 4 minus 2 is 2, 0 minus 1 is negative 1, 4 minus 3 is 1. Okay, so I have a vector connecting the two points. Did it matter if I labeled them the opposite way and subtracted them the other way? No, because I'm just trying to make an entire line. Okay, <clears throat> now uh, I just need uh, a point that it goes through and use the vector to create the equations, right? So I'll call this line AB, notice I'll just say AB without the, the vector over it, right? And I'll say that it's the equations where X is equal to two times T, because that's my vector component, right? It's like a slope, plus, and I'll use point A right here, two, right? Next, y is going to equal to negative 1, so negative t plus 1, right? And then z is going to equal to 3, uh, I'm sorry, not 3, 1 times t, and then plus 3, okay? Notice when t is 0, I get 2, 1, 3, this point. And when t is 1, 2 plus 2 is 4, negative 1 plus 1 is 0, and 1 plus 3 is 4. So t equals 0 is point A, and t equals 1 is point B. If you create, you know, a line from two points, and you use the vector between them, you know, to, to, as your uh, slopes for t, then it's like a percentage. The section of the line between a and B will be when T is all of the values between zero and one. And then if T is bigger than one, it's past point B. And if T is less than zero, it's all of the points before point A. So you can actually section out your line into those three sections. You have the section between A and B is when T is between zero and one. And then greater than one and less than zero can be your other sections of your line. Okay, how do I know if the line contains the point negative six, five, negative one? That's even easier than intersecting the two lines. That's just saying this is an X value, this is a Y value, this is a Z value. And if I set them into the X, Y, and Z, they just need to give me all the same T value. If they don't all give me the same T value, then that means that those don't occur together, in which case it's not that point. So here we go, negative uh, six, is equal to 2t plus 2, 5 is equal to negative t plus 1, and z is equal to, not z, negative 1 is equal to t plus 3, right? So if I solve for t here, I've got negative 8 divided by 2 is negative 4, here, if I add t and subtract 5, I get t is equal to negative 4. Looking good, right? Here, if I subtract the 3 over, I'll get t is equal to negative 4. Since these are all the same t value, you say yes. That point is actually on that line. And you can even tell me where on the line it is now too, remember? Since t is less than zero, it would have to be one of the points before point A on the line, right? It'll be on, on that side. If you have your vector from A to B, it'll be on the, the other side, the back side of it, right? Okay, 
So go take a look at both of these situations in GeoGebra. It can draw it way better than I can. So the first thing that GeoGebra can do better than me is graph. We were talking about graphing that line and then whether or not it was uh, intersecting these other two uh, line equations that we got. So line L here at the top, as you can see, we started by graphing these two points that we calculated on the line, right? Here's T0, here's T1. T0 is 1, 5, negative 1, and T1 is 3, 1, 2. And already you can see how much better uh, being able to look at it from different angles can show you the relationship between those two points. And then of course there's the line itself, L, which goes through both of those two points, which is the line that it asked us to graph. And this is the view that I drew on the board right here where the x-axis in red, y-axis in green is coming out at you. And there's that line. Okay, now the relationship with the other two lines. Line M, as we said on the board, is completely parallel to line L. You can see they'll never intersect. It's completely parallel. Okay, so we turn off line M. Here's line N. And look, from this angle, it looks like they intersect, don't they? Right? But wait, rotate it just right. And you can see there's a gap in between them. They're, they are very skew lines. Right? You can see the gap in between them. They do not intersect. The other side of the board, we were talking about the line that has these two points, point A and B, right? There they are, points A and points B, 213 and 404. And then we said that these were the equations of the line that would connect them. There it is. And then the last question was, does it contain this other point, negative 6, 5, negative 1? And the answer was yes. And then look, there it is way over here on this other bottom octant over here. Right? You can see point C right here is on that line. And in the order I told you about. right? Remember all of the values of T uh, between 0 and 1 are this section of the line all of the values of t greater than 1 are going to be this section of the line over here and any t less than 0 is going to be in this direction and remember this is t equals negative 4 way down here on this point in question let's move on to our next object of interest in the 3d space that we'll be dealing with Linear equations are upgraded from lines to planes. So all of the, the things that you're used to calling linear in the two-dimensional stuff you've been doing, and they, and they give you lines, now when you're in a space and you have something linear, it's going to give you a plane, right? So just imagine a line, but pulling and extruding it, right, along a sheet. That's what a plane can be thought of, okay? A plane is just a collection of all the points along a sheet that does not curve, right? It's a flat sheet collection of points that goes forever in all directions, okay? The easiest way to define a plane is going to be the set of all vectors that are perpendicular to one normal vector, okay? So imagine you pick one normal vector and then imagine all the other vectors that have to be perpendicular at a right angle to it would have to be all of the vectors that go all the way around like this so if the normal vector is coming out at you the plane would consist of all of these vectors here right so the easiest way for us to define the plane is by picking a normal vector you get your plane, the normal vector is the vector that's perpendicular to the plane like that. Okay? So by definition, if a vector is perpendicular to another one, 
their dot product is zero, right? So if I dot the, the two vectors, right? X component times X component plus Y component times Y component, so on and so on, that should give me zero if the two vectors are perpendicular, right? Or in vector terminology, orthogonal, right? Okay, so for the definition of the plane, the normal vector n is going to be perpendicular to v, where I'm letting v be representative of any vector in the plane. And the way that I'm doing that is I'm just picking some point in the plane, p, some point, and then I'm letting the other end of the vector be a generic point, x, y, z, right? So v could literally point in any direction of the plane, okay? And that represents all of the v vectors that are in the plane. And then this would be the equation of such a vector. I would have the x component of the generic point minus the x component of the p, so on and so on for all the dimensions. So this is representative of any vector inside of a plane that is containing the point px, py, pz, right? Containing the point p, basically. So, if V is in the plane, that means V must be perpendicular to N. Therefore, N dot V is zero. Well, if you do that dot product, that's going to be the X component of N times the X component of V, which is all of that, X minus PX, plus N, uh, Y component of N, Y component of V, plus Z component of N times Z component of V. Right? And each component of V is a binomial. And that should equal zero. This is actually one of the formats of a plane right here. You can have number times binomial with a variable, number times binomial, number times binomial, so on and so on. The only variables in here are X, Y, and Z. Look really closely, right? Because you should you're supposed to know the coordinates of the normal vector, the components, I mean, and you're supposed to know the coordinates of some point in the plane. So you have all of that information, you're plugging in those numbers, x, y, and z are your variables. And then if you distribute, combine, whatever you can, it can become this other format that we call the general form of a plane. The general form of a plane, notice, is linear, x to the one, y to the one, z to the one. And the a, b, and c that you see here in general form are actually the components of the normal vector, right? Notice nx times x, I'm using to represent ax there, okay? So actually the a, b, and c here are actually the components of the normal vector when it's in this uh, general form here, okay? Some other things that go along with talking about planes. We may be interested in finding an angle between two planes we may also be interested, and will be interested, in finding an intersection of two planes, right? An intersection of two planes is just a line, right? It's the line where one plane shoots into another one. Do they have to be at a right angle? No. Two planes could be at something less than a right angle, as you see what I have uh, tried to really hard draw here, okay? So the way we treat this is like this. If I want to find the angle between the two um, between the two planes, okay, then that angle is actually the same as if I were to take the two normal vectors off of each plane and intersect them. Notice it's the same angle here as it is here, okay? Because of the way our system is built on right angles, the normal vectors are going to meet at the same angle as the plane angle being formed between the two planes. Well, you know how to find the angle between two vectors. That's using the alternate form of dot product, where it's been rearranged. The cosine of that angle is equal to the dot product divided by the multiplication of the magnitudes of those vectors. So I can find the angle using that formula. Okay. Also, like I was saying, <clears throat> we'll be interested in finding the intersection line of two planes. And the, the way that we go about that is, well, I mean, you could just take the two equations that you have for each plane, put them together in a system, 
and then that could actually be you know solved down to some sort of uh, set of equations there's a much simpler way of doing it though if you notice L is a set of points right the line that they intersect in is a set of points that they share that's the whole point of an intersection it's the set of points that they both have in them right okay so that means that it would have to be made up of a vector that is in both planes because it's a line right remember every line has a L vector in it so if you if you pick out the the L vector here which is the direction of that line it would have to be a vector that's contained in both planes well what did we say about vectors in planes if a vector is in a plane it has to be perpendicular to that plane's normal but this vector is in both planes so this vector for this line has to be perpendicular to both normals so how do we know how to create a vector that is perpendicular to two other vectors cross product if you do the cross product of the two normal vectors it will give you the vector that is in that line the vector that makes up the direction of that line right and remember to make a line all I need is a point and a vector right so once I have the intersecting vector all I need to do is find a point that the that both planes share and you can do that just by plugging in a few numbers and solving one little piece we'll do an example okay but you can cross product the two normals of each uh, of the two planes and that will give you the intersecting lines vector then you just need to find a point okay some other calculations that come up with planes and lines uh, are the distance type of calculations if we have some point out in space and we would like to find the distance from that point either to a line or from that point to a plane and it may not be as simple as just having the point um, these calculations are also useful for hey what's the distance between these two parallel planes you could pick a, a point in each one and still perform these same exact calculations or uh, how far is it from this line that's parallel to this plane you can do all kinds of calculations but it comes from picking a point and doing a distance either to a line or to a plane okay so here's the gist of each one of these if I want to do the distance from a point to a line right that's the little length that I have right here D the way that you find that height right here is that it also happens to be the height of a parallelogram with this vector here okay you can um, well I'll just draw it out this way it happens to be the height of this parallelogram and don't forget that the way that the um, the cross product works is if you are crossing two vectors and taking the length then that's the same as the area of a parallelogram so what are we doing here I'm doing this cross product then dividing by one of the lengths so I'm getting the the height right here basically right another way of thinking of it is it's the same idea as doing the cross product of PQ with this unit vector L okay other question what's PQ all I was given was a point P and a line you're correct so here's what you do when you have a question of I wish to find the distance from this point to this line I have a point here yeah, I have a line I find a point somewhere on the line and it doesn't matter where and I create a vector between the point that I was given and the point that I just found on the line that's PQ the vector PQ once you create that vector I cross product that with the lines personal vector then I divide by the length of the line vector okay so it, it comes down to finding a point that's on this line 
it's very similar to the process that I need to do to find the distance from a point to a plane. If I'm given a point and some plane, what I do is I pick another point anywhere on the plane, doesn't matter where, and I make a vector from the point given to the point that I just found, PQ. Then I find the dot product of PQ with the normal vector n, and I divide by the length of n. If you're paying attention really close to this formula, it should look a little familiar to you from your vector analysis days. That's the projection of the vector PQ onto the um, dimension of n. And notice that's exactly what's happening. Basically, the shadow of PQ becomes the distance, the perpendicular distance from the plane to the point. Okay? So we have these two formulas for finding our distances when we need them. Let's go take a look at a few examples of dealing with planes. Now let's work a few examples that deal with planes. Let's find the angle between two planes that we know the equations for. We've been given these planes, okay? And then also, let's find the equations, or, or parametric equations rather, that represent the line uh, where the two planes intersect, okay? Let's start with the angle. So to find the angle, remember, we're gonna be taking the two normal vectors out of the planes, right? And crossing them. Um, well, no, dotting them here, sorry, crossing them here. We're gonna be where they cross, right, is going to form the angle. And I'll be using the, the dot product method of the vectors to find the angle in between them. So what are the two normal vectors here? Well, remember, the normal vectors come from the coefficients. So I have two, I have one, and I have negative three for this one. And then I have one, there's no y here. So there'll be a zero and a four from those two equations, right? So N1, yeah, let's put it here. N1 is going to be the vector 2, 1, negative 3. And N2 is going to be the vector 1, 0, 4. Okay? So I've got the normal vectors for these planes here. Next, I'm going to uh, dot them, right? So let's do the dot product. Cosine theta is gonna be equal to absolute value of, the dot product, remember, is I multiply each corresponding component and then add those up. So I have two times one plus one times zero plus negative three times four. Okay, and then I need to multiply their lengths, their magnitudes. So that's gonna be square root of two squared plus one squared plus negative three squared. So that's four, one, and nine added up times the magnitude of this normal vector, one squared, zero squared, four squared, square root of one plus zero plus 16, okay? So I've got cosine theta is equal to, that's gonna be negative 10 with an absolute value, so just 10. And by the way, if you forget the absolute value here, you'll still get a correct answer. But remember, in between any two you know, planes or lines, you've got a acute angle and you've got an obtuse angle. If you happen to keep the negative, if there is one, right, then you'll just get the obtuse version instead of the acute one. And we typically like to use the acute angle, not the obtuse angle. But it's okay if you do, it's not incorrect. However, I went ahead and dropped the negative. And then in my denominator here, I'll use the square root of, and I've got 
5 and 9 is 14 times. And notice what I'm doing is I'm merging the two square roots into one square root. It makes it easier uh, to deal with. Uh, 17, right? Okay, so in my calculator, I am physically going to type this in. Theta is equal to the arc cosine, inverse cosine of 10 divided by square root of 14 times 17. Why don't I just go ahead and, and figure out that that's uh, 238? Don't need to, right? I don't need to do the 14 times 17 uh, to get the 238. I can simply type it, uh, save myself a minute or two, or, or if you're someone that doesn't like to do the multiplications in your head like that, like so. So I type it just as I have it here. And let's see, make sure I'm in degrees first. And I have 49.6. Let's double check just to be sure. Yep, 49.6 degrees in between uh, the two planes, right? Okay, so now the equation for the intersection. Remember, what we're actually doing here is we're going to be finding a line where these two planes meet. And a line requires parametric equations. So I'm going to start by finding the vector that the line uses for its direction. And we do that by crossing the two normal vectors. Remember, the two normal vectors, I'm going to need something that's perpendicular to both, because that will be in both planes. So I'm going to take the cross product of those two, right? So my L vector, not the L line equation yet, but just the L vector, is going to be equal to the cross product, I, J, K, and 2, 1, 3, negative 3, 1, 0, 4. Remember, it matters which way you put things in a cross product, right? But here, we would get away with it no matter which way we did this because whether I get the vector pointed this way or this way, either way, those are still going to give me the same line. All right. So let's see. I have my I vector here is 4 minus 0. Uh, plus, no, minus, right? Minus. My J column here is 8 plus 3J. And plus, don't forget, the reason why I have the minus here is because the uh, when you do the determinant by the columns, right, they alternate. Okay. And then for my k here, I've got 0 minus 1 k. Okay, so my L vector is the vector 4, negative 11, and negative 1. Right? 4, negative 11, negative 1. <clears throat> Now that I have the vector direction of that line, all I need is a point that is uh, on both planes at the same time that's in the intersection. I just need a point and the vector, and I can create the, uh, the parametric equations here. Okay, So I've got my two equations here. I'm going to start with the bottom one, x plus 4z equals 12. Okay. So look right here, x plus 4z equals 12. And I'm sort of separating this here, okay? So notice in this equation, it'll actually be pretty easy to find a couple of numbers. I just need to find a, pair, a point that works in both equations. 
Um, so one thing that I can do is just start by picking one. It, it really doesn't matter. I'm going to let x be 0. Then I'm going to have the equation 4z equals 12, which tells me that z is 3 when x is 0. Well, that's almost an entire point, isn't it? If I take x equals 0 and z equals 3 and plug it into the other equation, 2x plus y minus 3z equals 6, plug in these two values, right, I'll have y minus 9 equals 6. That tells me that y would have to be 15. So now I have the point 0, 15, 3 which must be in the intersection of those two because it works with both equations. Zero and three work for this equation and zero, 15, and three make this equation true also. Okay, so I have a point and I have a vector. Therefore, my line of intersection would have to be where x is four t plus zero y is going to be negative 11t plus 15, and z is going to be negative t plus 3. And, and t is really allowed to just be any number, right? There's my intersection line. Okay? Here's something else that's going to come up sometimes, being able to just create the equation of a plane. In this case, we have three points to, to make the equation of this plane. Okay, well remember how we create the plane, the most easiest is to create a normal vector, right? Well, the long way, of course, of making this would be to set these up in uh, equations, 3x minus 4y plus z, uh, equals something, this plus this plus this equals something, and then have to solve the equations. You, you could find a normal vector that way too, with ma and you could use matrices and all those others. The easiest thing to do though is to create a normal vector with a cross product. Think about this for a second. If I create a vector from one point to the other point, then that vector has to be completely inside of the plane because a vector is linear and the plane is also linear. They're straight, right? So if I go straight from one point to another and they're supposed to both be in the plane, the entire vector's in the plane, right? Same thing here. If I make another vector from this point to this point, that vector would also have to be in the plane. So if I have two vectors in the plane, their cross product would have to be perpendicular to both of them, therefore giving me the normal vector. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create two vectors that are inside of the plane that I'm interested in, right? So uh, what what will also make this easier is I'm going to use the same origination point. So I'm going to make a vector from P to C and I'm going to make a vector from P to D, all right? So they basically are sharing an endpoint of P in the middle of the two vectors. So PC is the vector 3 minus 0, negative 4 minus 5, and 1 minus 0. Okay, then PD vector, again, N minus beginning, negative 2 minus 0 is negative 2, 3 minus 5 is negative 2, and negative six minus zero is negative six. Both of these vectors exist in the plane that I'm interested in, okay? So I'm gonna do the cross product of these to find my n vector, right? So n vector is going to be PC cross PD, which is I, J, K, 
I've got three, negative nine, one, negative two, negative two, negative six. Okay. I'll go ahead and just break this down directly into the things instead of drawing the i, j, and k. In, when, when I take out the i column and row, I'm left with uh, 54 minus negative 2. So 54 plus 2, basically. And then when I go to the middle j, remember it's going to be opposite. So I've got negative 18 minus negative 2. So that would have been negative 18 plus 2. And I have the extra negative because of the way it's alternating. And then for my k right here, I've got negative 6 minus 18. Okay, for my vector there. <clears throat> so my n vector comes out to be 56, uh, 16, and negative 24, okay? But one thing I want you to notice, all of those are multiples of eight. It's completely okay to just take a scalar version of this answer. And the reason is because this n vector is strictly to have that direction coming out. I could even make it go in the opposite direction if I wanted to change all the signs. It would still work to get me the equation of this plane. So to make this a little bit easier on myself, if I happen to notice that there's a scalar multiple that I can easily factor out, I'm going to do it. So notice this is the same thing as 8 times the vector 7, 2, negative 3. Okay? So then I know that I can create the equation of my plane using that setup from the last, uh, from the last scene uh, a moment ago. Remember, we took the, the components, nx times x minus a point at x plus ny, y minus the point at uh, coordinate of y, and nz, z minus pz equals zero, right? Okay, so what I'm going to choose is for my normal vector here, right? I'm, I'm letting this actually right here be my normal vector. I'm going to take the smaller scaled down version. Like I said, you can do that because notice if, it, if I use the larger numbers here, I could have just divided by eight everywhere and zero divided by eight is still zero, so it would work out. I'm going to use this as my normal vector here, and I can use any of these points. I just need a point that's in the plane. Well, I'm going to pick the one that's the easiest, right? The ones with the zeros and, and smaller numbers in it. Okay, so here we go. I've got 7 times x minus 0 plus 2 times y minus 5 plus negative 3 times z minus 0 equals 0. Right there, right? I've got the setup here. So look, this is just 7x plus 2y minus 10 minus 3z equals 0. So really, just to write it in that standard form, 7x plus 2y minus 3z minus 10 equals 0. And, and also, some people may argue, oh, well, instead of putting minus 10 and equal to 0, you could have just added the 10 over and made it just equal to 10. And that's fine, too. Either way uh, will work just fine. Okay? So, how do I know for sure that this is the equation of the plane that contains those three points? Well, what is an equation supposed to do? It's supposed to be true when I plug in the coordinates from points, right? So let's test it. Obviously, it works with 0, 5, 0, because 2 times 5 is 10, and the other ones would be 0, 
right? We created it from that point. What about the other points? Three, negative four, one. That would be 21 minus eight minus three. So that'd be 21 minus 11, which is 10, and it's equal to 10. Uh, negative two, three, negative six. So that'd be negative 14 plus six plus 18, okay? So six plus 18 is 24, and then minus the 14 would give me 10. Notice that when you plug in the points, they all work perfectly to give a true statement in that equation. So that is the equation of whatever object contains those three points. And I know it's a plane because it's linear, x to the one, y to the one, z to the one, right? So this must be the equation of the plane that contains those three points. So let's break this down and look at what we've got here. We had these two planes, and the first thing we needed to do was to calculate the angle in between them. Well, first, you just take a look at the two planes here, right? One in blue, one in red. And you can see there definitely is an angle between them. They do intersect at some line, and there's an angle in between them. And as I was saying in the lecture, uh, we calculate the acute angle between the two, as you can see where they meet right here, there's going to be an obtuse angle here and an acute angle here. We calculated the acute, but GeoGebra is insisting on calculating the obtuse one, right? But we calculated 49.6 basically, and as you can see what we've got is the other 130.4 for the obtuse. So it's really the same calculation, um, it's just looking at it from the other perspective really. Okay next we were asked to calculate the intersection line between the two and what we got was the 4t for x, negative 11t plus 15 for y, and negative t plus 3 for z. Don't let uh, on all these things don't let the fact that I'm using negative 10 to 10 throw you off that's just numbers large enough to go off the edge. Technically t should be negative infinity to infinity. But look, here's that line, and you see it is definitely the line that intersects the two, right? Taking the cross product does get me the vector that points in the direction of this intersection here. On the other side of the screen, we talked about three points. Here they are. Let me turn this plane off for a second. And let's turn off the axes. There are those three points, just floating around in space. And we computed the plane that contains the three. Here it is. As you can see, all three of those points are now coplanar in this plane. 7x plus 2y minus 3z equals 10. Let's go ahead and turn on the axes and the xy plane again so that you can get an idea of where we're at, right? Here's that first main octant right here. Next, let's talk about some of those distance calculations, and then let me show you an alternate on one of them as well, okay? So let's start by talking about the distance between a point and a line. Then I want to do the distance between that same point and some plane. And then I want to show you an alternate on the distance between a point and a plane. Okay? Now remember the idea here is to go from a point to a line that I want to pick some point on the line and I'm going to create a vector from the given point to the found point. Right? And then I'll use that vector in the formula with the lines vector, okay? So I'm gonna call it Q, right? Point Q is gonna be some point on the line. That's easy. Remember the line is supposed to be created with a point. So just let T equal zero if you want. Zero, 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 I'll have zero, 15, and three. Like so, okay? So now let's make this vector. 
PQ is going to be a vector that's coming from the point out in space to the line, right? It's not going to be perpendicular necessarily, so I can't just take the length of it, but I can use it in the formula. Okay, so 0 minus 2 is negative 2. 15 minus negative 5 is 20. And 3 minus 1 is 2. Okay, so I have this vector, and I'm going to plug it into my distance formula. Remember, distance is supposed to be the length of PQ cross L divided by the length of L there, right? Okay. So then here, my L vector is the 4, negative 11, negative 1, right? We can see the, the, the line vector, or the numbers in front of T there. So I'm going to do the magnitude of PQ cross L here, okay? So I'm going to uh, get the cross product of these two, all right? In fact, I need to make some space. Let's make a little space there. So PQ cross L, I, J, and K, right? Okay. And that's going to be negative 2, 20, and 2, and then 4, negative 11, and negative 1, right? And let's see, for the I portion, I'll have negative 20 plus 22. So negative 20 plus 22 is 2. All right. For the J, don't forget I'll be alternating the, the sign, right? But I'll have 2 minus 8, which is negative 6, but it's opposite. So 6 right? And then for the K, I'll have 22 minus 80. So 22 minus 80 is negative 58, right? And don't forget when you're cross product, uh, doing the cross product of two things, you can always check by dotting, right? If I dot this vector with this one, it should come out to be zero because they're supposed to be uh, orthogonal with each other, right? So I've got negative 4, I've got 120, and I've got negative 116, right? So negative 4 and negative 116 give me negative 120 with positive 120, so it equals 0. It is perpendicular with that vector, right? And the same thing with the, the L vector that I have up in here, 4, negative 11, negative 1, okay? So this is the, the PQ cross L vector. And what I want is the length of that thing, right? So the magnitude of this guy right here, of PQ cross L, is going to be the square root of 2 squared plus 6 squared plus 58 squared. Woo, that's going to be a, a doozy, right? And then I want to divide by the magnitude of the L vector, right? Okay, so let's make this a little uh, easier on myself here. I'm just going to type it all in at once. My distance is going to be the square root of 4 plus 36 plus 58 squared divided by square root of, and I'm doing the magnitude of L now. That's going to be 16 plus 121 plus 1, right? Let's crunch it out and see what we get.
five five. Okay. All right. Now the the plane that I had selected here was the plane that you may have remembered seeing earlier. It was 2x plus y minus 3z equals 6. And we were going to talk about how to find the distance from this p point here, right, to this plane. So again, we need to start with finding another point that's in the plane, right? Okay, so if you remember, we had already found a point that was in there. It was actually the point that we used uh, for the intersection there. It happens to be 0, 15, and 3 also, right? 0, 15, and 3 uh, gives me 0 plus 15 minus 9. 15 minus 9 is 6, okay? So my, my second point in this case Coincidentally, just because of the, the way I picked my plane here, happens to be the same point as, as up here. That's just a coincidence. That has nothing to do... Well, it, I mean, that line was part of this plane, but uh, again. Okay, so right here, I'm going to make a vector from P to Q again, just like we did up there. So I'll make PQ vector, incidentally the same thing, right? Negative 2, 20, and 2. But now, when I have this to calculate my distance, remember all I'm doing is a projection. So I'll be doing the absolute value of PQ dotted with the normal vector, and then I'll be dividing by the length of my normal vector. So PQ dot N. Here N is 2, 1, negative 3, right? That's the, that's the normal vector here, the coefficients. 2, 1, and negative 3. And I'm going to dot it with PQ. Okay? So I've got 2 times negative 2 plus 1 times 20 plus negative 3 times 2, right? And then I'm going to divide by the length of n here, okay? So the, the magnitude of the n vector is just the square root of 2 squared plus 1 squared plus negative 3 squared. Okay, so my distance should be equal to, I've got negative 4, negative 6, which is negative 10, plus 20 is 10, divided by the square root of 14, right? And then what does that come out to be? We have 2.672. Okay, so let's do this same calculation, finding the distance from this point P to this plane A right here. But let's use this alternate formula here. What, what this is is just another way of looking at simplifying these calculations. This is what's happening geometrically, and this is sort of an algebra twist on the geometry. Basically what you're doing is even though the point 2, negative 5, 1 is not on the plane right here, I'm basically going to plug the point into the equation. Notice it's a times x1, b times y1, c times z1, right? That's like taking this point and plugging it in. And of course, if you do that in the equation, it's false, right? You'll get some number equals a different number, all right? But that's what we want here. This distance basically is coming from... If I plug this in, 
whatever number I get subtracted from the D that should be there is a small amount of error, right? And then I'm taking the absolute value of that error and dividing it by the size of the, the normal vector itself to give it the, the size uh, relative to the plane, okay? So you can see how this distance uh, is very closely related to the geometry over here. All right, so let's try it this other way. My distance should be equal to my plane is <clears throat> 2x plus y minus 3z, but I'm plugging in the point that I'm trying to find the distance of, 2, negative 5, 1. So that's going to be 2 times 2 uh, plus y is negative 5 minus 3 times z is 1. Now notice here, I technically could should rewrite this as minus 6 and equals 0 because of the way this is set up here. You see how the, the general form here has d on one side all together with the equation? So what I've basically done here is I've just subtracted the 6 over. And that's what I'm going to do here, minus 6. And then square root of a squared plus b squared plus c squared. That should be familiar, right? I'm just getting the a, b, and c from the plane equation, which is really the coordinates of the normal vector, right? That's what a, b, and c are. So 2 squared plus 1 squared plus 3 squared, right? So it's definitely giving the, the same denominator there of square root of 14. And then right here I've got 4 minus 5 minus 3 minus 6. Okay, so 4 minus 5 is negative 1. Minus 3 is negative 4. Minus 6 is negative 10. But it's absolute value, so I just get 10. Notice that that's the exact same calculation that we got here. So there's two different ways that we have for computing the distance from a point to a plane, okay? Now here's a little interesting side question. This line is part of this plane. Remember, we, we've, we found it earlier. This line was the intersection of this plane and another one. That means that this line is contained inside of this plane. Why do you think the distance from the point to this line and that same point to this plane is different then, right? Let's think about that for a moment and then go take a look at it in GeoGebra. For these distance calculations, we started with the point P, 2, negative 5, 1, and the line 4T, negative 11T plus 15, and negative T plus 3. Okay, so we're doing the distance, which you need to realize is the length of the line that connects these two at a right angle. It would be the length of this line right here. Okay, so then that's where the, the, the 4.9 measurement comes from. But first, what we really had to do, remember, was we picked a point Q that was on the line, and I had to draw the vector between the point in question and that new point. So that's the PQ vector that we used in our calculation, in both calculations actually. And then in accordance with this line right here, as you can see, I was just getting the, the length of that line there. Okay. Then for the next bit, we were doing the distance from the point to this plane. All right? Let's turn off this plane here so you can get a better view on it. So for this point, remember again, we had to pick another point that was on the plane, like Q, and I had to get the vector that connects the two. And then I had to interact that in our uh, formula with the vector that is perpendicular, right? So technically, the normal vector would be in this direction, right here. However, the, the vector itself is not that whole line. 
and instead what we're interested in is getting the distance to the plane here which is this which is where the 2.6 is coming from and then I, I pose the other question to you why do you think that the two distances are different okay and let's go ahead and answer that it has to do with being at a right angle to the distance being measured so let's turn on the line here right that was the line that we were originally doing our distance measure from here that's our line and if I turn on both of the pieces that represent the distance measurements you can see this one and this one are actually two different segments and for different measurements the lower segment here is at a right angle to the plane and therefore I only need the distance of the 2.6 there whereas the other segment here is at a right angle to the line even though the line is in the plane that doesn't mean that it's the perfect set of points to do the distance to the whole plane itself so as you can see it's two completely different measurements even though the line is in the plane One last thing that you'll probably be interested in is graphing planes because you're, you're going to want a visual of these things in your head but also at the same time if you ever have to put these things down on paper um, let's have a, an, an okay decent method for doing that. At the end of the day and at the end of this uh, look closely though GeoGebra does a way better job and I'll show you that too. Okay. But you definitely want to be able to do this by hand because you can't always have the computer by your side. So let's take the equation 3x plus 2y plus 4z equals 12. First of all, knowing that it's a plane is important, right? Knowing what you're shooting towards makes the, the shape a lot easier to graph. In the next section, you'll see we have several different objects that we want to try and graph in a similar way. And knowing the shape beforehand is extremely helpful. Okay, so I know this is a plane because everything's linear, x to the 1, y to the 1, z to the 1. All right, um, the easiest way to do a plane, I know it's completely, you know, flat, straight everywhere. And everything is positive, so it's going to be up in this front octant right in front of you here. Uh, if it wasn't, then I may have rotated my view a little bit depending on which way I, I could imagine uh, would be and, and that takes a little bit of practice, but but you get the idea, okay? The easiest thing to do is to draw what we call the traces of the shape and every shape, you know, should have traces of this kind. What you've got is the XZ trace, the XY trace, and the ZY trace. And basically what this is is what it would look like just in those planes, right? So where does the object hit? the XZ plane up against that wall there, right? And where does the object hit the XY plane on the floor? And where does it hit the ZY plane up against here? Well, it is a plane hitting those other planes. So it should be hitting it like a line, right? The easiest thing to do is to find the intercepts for each axis. That'll give you a dead giveaway of where this thing is laying. So let's do some calculations first, right? Some calculations here would be uh, the x-intercept. And in that case, remember what that means is I'm letting both z and y go to zero, and I'm just going to be along the x-axis. If I let z and y be zero, I have 3x equals 12. Well, that tells me x is 4. What's the y-intercept? Right? That means I would let x and z be 0, so 2y equals 12. I'm getting y is equal to 6. Same thing for the z-intercept, right? I'm going to let the other two coordinates be 0, and I'm going to get z equals 3. Okay, so with that information, I'm going to create the traces. So let's go down each axis. Uh, x equals 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, that's right here, okay? And then the y-intercept, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, that would be here. So if I connect those two points directly just in the plane, now remember this is on the floor of the graph, 
okay? That is where the plane is hitting the XY plane, the floor that I have of this octant. My Z intercept is at three. So that's right here, right? So now I'll connect up these two. When you're doing this on paper, by the way, I still recommend using the straight edge. So this line right here represents the ZX trace or the XZ trace, right? It's a line, of course, it's a plane hitting a plane. And then this line right here will be the YZ trace. And notice, once I have those three put together, basically just imagine that there's a distance from this origin up to the plane, right? So I've got my three axes and the plane is basically sitting like flat facing the corner like that, right? The origin being here and the plane is out from it, right? So my plane is here. This is the plane, but this is only a piece of the plane that's in that first main octant, okay? We don't actually have a numbering scheme for the octants. So the, the main octant, the, the original octant, the positive octant, the whatever octant you want to call it, right? There's more of the plane beneath the XY here. There's more of the plane past the YZ wall. There's more of the plane out this way, right? It would technically uh, go out in all directions that stay linear from this, right? All directions this way that stay linear. Here that stay linear, right? The plane actually spreads out in all directions. This is just the piece that I can see if I limit myself to only positive coordinates of X, Y, and Z. Again, me noticing that these were all positive beforehand was how I knew it was going to be in this main octant. If you had some prior knowledge like, oh, I, I can see some of my intercepts might be negative, then you would probably have wanted to either extend your axes to graph those negatives, or you may have even wanted to consider rotating your view a little bit, which is easier to do in a computer, I know. But you can actually start by picturing it in your head, and then you can just try to draw a, a higher twisted angle, you know, where the Z might be coming a little bit more out at you, and then have X and Y this way, if the plane is going to be maybe more in this side octant over here or whatever, right? So knowing a little bit of information beforehand, before you draw these things does help, okay? Here, this example. What if I'm missing one of the variables? Just like in 2D, if you're missing a variable, that doesn't mean that you graph less of the object, right? In two dimensions, if I have y equals 6, it doesn't give you a single point just because I'm missing the x. Remember, it gives you a horizontal line. In 3D, much the same. If I'm missing a variable, that doesn't mean that it's going to be not a plane anymore. Remember, if it's in three dimensions, missing a variable, it's still going to graph a two-dimensional object, a plane in this case, a surface, okay? I can't lose that uh, size of dimension just because I lose a variable. All it means is this particular surface, this plane, for example, doesn't depend on y. In fact, it would be completely parallel to the y-axis. Notice I can get an x-intercept and a Z intercept, right? Um, but in this case, I won't be using a Y intercept because I don't have one, right? Okay, so let me put a few more marks on here. Let's see. Okay, so I just needed a few more coordinates there. So look, my x-intercept is when z is 0, right? So that's going to be 6. That's going to be this point right here. Okay? 
x equals 6. And then when x is 0, I get z equals 6 over 4, or in other words, 3 over 2, which is 1 and a half, right? That's right here. If I connect those two like this, then I'm getting the xz trace, right? I don't have a y-intercept. So uh, do I have a yz trace? Well, sure I do. Sure I do. It still has to hit the, the plane because it's going in that way. But it doesn't ever hit the y-axis. So imagine a plane, right, never hitting a line. In this case, the line is the y-axis. The plane is going to be parallel to it like that. Okay, but I have to imagine it still going out this way. So the trace has got to be parallel the y-axis. Well, if my y-axis is like this, right, I'll just move that parallel out to here. And let's see, let's keep it parallel. Like this. Okay, it's parallel to the y-axis now. And that is the yz trace right there, this piece right here, right? Okay, well, I'm almost done. Really, to, to finish graphing the plane, I would wanna just keep that same sense of parallel down to here. The xy trace is basically it hitting over here, right? It's gonna come up from here and it's gonna come down into the floor. So I just need to keep it parallel there. So I'll just do my best. Since it's that far away, right? This is gonna be the plane, like that. I'll just make this parallel to that. Horrible job of it. That's a little bit better. And like this, right? Okay, so again, notice that the, the plane is here, right? But it's not actually hitting the y-axis. It is going through the xz plane with two intercepts there on each axis, but it is completely missing the y-axis, right? It does hit the xy plane. Its trace is over here. And also don't forget, it's a plane. It does actually still extend in all directions uh, that stay linear from this path, okay? Lastly, look at this one. What if I'm only having one variable, I'm missing the other two, right? It's still a plane, but it will only intersect this axis, right? which means it would have to be completely parallel to both of the other axes that it's not intersecting. Z equals three is a plane in 3D space. The plane that hits Z equals three and no other axis, right? So then the ZX trace would have to be completely parallel to the X axis same thing with the, the ZY trace. It would have to be completely parallel to the Y axis, like so. And then of course, you, you, it would extend outward from there as well, okay? But I've got the, the plane sitting above it right there. That's a horrible freehand that I just did just then, sorry. But you can see the, the ZX trace here is this line that's parallel to the X axis. And this ZY trace here is also the same thing, parallel to the Y. And there is no XY trace now. It never hits the XY plane because it's parallel. This plane is parallel to the XY plane, right? It's hovering above it basically. <clears throat> Okay, 
And of course, don't forget, it does extend, you know, outward in all of these directions. And it's just going to be a collection of all of the points that have a Z coordinate of three. Okay. Um, like I said, GeoGebra does a way better job, but is important for you to understand some of the basics, like finding these traces and things like that. Uh, and being able to just draw a rudimentary version of these. It, it could be crucial to the way you understand things, okay? So definitely practice this. And I hope this discussion on lines and planes has really got you going for multivariable calculus. So real quick, just to show you how much better this can draw than I can, um, let's, uh, let's take a look at those three graphs that we just did. Let me reiterate though, this thing can draw better than me, but you, you should learn to draw these by hand anyway, because you're not always going to have a computer by your side. So here's the first one. Here's the way GeoGebra graphs that first plane, 3x plus 2y plus 4z equals 12, right? Much better than I could draw it, and honestly a lot more than I drew, okay? But here are those intercepts that we had. Right? There are those intercept points where they hit the axes. And then these are the segments that we drew as the traces, that the YZ trace, the XZ trace, and the XY trace, right? In all the different directions. So all we drew was just this section of the of the plane there in that first octant. Right? But as I was saying before, you can see the plane actually goes on in all directions. We we're only seeing a part of it when we drew it like that. Okay. For that next one, x plus 4z equals 6. Here it is. As you can see, it does not touch the y-axis, as we said. The intercepts that we drew were here. And here's the trace. I actually go ahead and drew the whole line because if you remember, the, the trace, the, the xz trace should be the entire plane there. So the plane is going on forever, just like that line is going on forever there. That's the trace between the two. Okay. Completely parallel with the y-axis though. Okay. And then that last one. Z equals 3. Just a plane parallel with the with the bottom floor there. And just floating above it three at every distance here. Right. This was the, the perspective that we had on the board. Doesn't do it much justice. It's almost better if you can see it this way. But then that looks a little too too thin, you know. So it's better to have these multiple angles that we can look at the thing.